Hey folks, Kosti here, and in today's video, I wanna talk about how to best use chess engines, specifically when you're trying to analyze your own games or when you're working on your chess and analyzing the games of strong players. Because obviously engines are one of the most powerful tools out there for the average chess improver, but they are also very easily misused. So in this video, I wanna help players of all levels learn to use the engine more effectively. And I also wanna share a couple of techniques that I and other players use when we're trying to uncover hidden resources in a position, or generally just trying to extract the most instructive value out of any given chess game. Now, a lot of coaches will say that you shouldn't analyze your games with an engine, at least not until you first analyze them on your own. And while I generally agree with that notion that a player should kind of reflect on their own games, try to figure out where they went wrong without any assistance, and only then check with the engine, the reality is that most players don't really have a coach or a training partner to work with, and it's very difficult to analyze games on your own without any kind of help or guidance. And while I do think the best way to analyze your games is with a coach or a fellow training partner, if you are going to be working on your own and using the engine, well, I'd rather you learn to use the engine effectively. And so this video is for you. And by the way, if you are looking to find a training partner, well, the best place to do it is on our Discord. So check for a link in the description, join the Discord, and we have a dedicated channel there for players to seek out and find training partners around their level. So I would strongly encourage you guys to take advantage of that. And while I have you here, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure to do so. It really does help us out a lot. Okay, so there are a couple of ways that the engines are limited that it's really important for us to understand. Number one, the engine is not perfect. Your average engine can calculate millions of positions per second, but as the tree of variations expands and expands, the engine is going to have a limit as to how far it can see. And the evaluation that it gives you is not necessarily going to be the truth. It's just the engine's opinion of a variation that it believes to be best for both sides. But that evaluation is not final, and often when you play through the suggested moves of an engine, its evaluation of the position will change along the way. And that should tell you that its initial evaluation was by no means the final word. Moreover, engines heavily depend on the kind of hardware that they're running on, meaning if you're just using a built-in engine on one of the main sites like chess.com or LeeChess, this engine is not going to be as fast or as strong as if you were running, let's say, Stockfish, for instance, on your local laptop or desktop. But if you do want to run Stockfish on your local computer, you'll need a program that will allow you to actually set up a chess position, load Stockfish in, run the analysis, and then save it. But for the vast majority of players, they're probably going to be okay with just using the chess.com engine that's built right into the browser uh, or the one on Lee Chess. And although these engines are not that strong, if you do let them run long enough, you'll see that they can actually reach a reasonable depth. Now, before we go any further, I want to give a couple of quick shout outs. Number one to Grandmaster Mikhailo Alexenko and his YouTube channel. Uh, Mikhailo has a number of really interesting videos where he shows uh, positions and puzzles that Stockfish often gets wrong or takes a very long time to solve. Uh, and that just shows that chess is a very deep game. And a lot of times as a human, you have to really guide the engine if you want it to analyze the position in a really effective way. And that means suggesting your own moves. Number two for readers of Chess Life magazine, uh, you can check out a really nice article in here by Grandmaster Jacob Agard about using engines to analyze your games. Basically the same topic that this video is all about. A really, really good article and I would strongly encourage you guys to check that out as well. So now I want to talk about a couple of key techniques when it comes to using the engine in your analysis. Uh, and while chess.com is thinking about this position at hand, this is a position I pulled from the game between Christopher Yu and Conrad Holt, two really, really strong players. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the key mistakes that players make when using the engine. Uh, number one, believing everything that the engine says as some kind of final word. Just because the engine says some position is plus 0.5, half a pawn for white, or minus 0.3, that doesn't necessarily mean that 
white is going to be necessarily better or black is going to be better. Again, it's just the engine's uh, evaluation. And the engine doesn't really give a sense of how easy or difficult it is to play one or the other side. Number two, the second key mistake is simply not letting the engine run long enough. Uh, in general, I think a depth of somewhere around uh, 30 for Stockfish is going to be decent. Uh, as you might say, this is where the analysis even starts. Anything under that and the engine is going to be missing lots of potential resources that can very easily be overlooked. And number three, the third uh, key mistake that players make is not using their own ideas during analysis, because this is how you actually learn and improve your game. You gotta inject some of your own ideas. Of course, this is what happens when you play a game and sometimes your ideas work out, sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it's really crucial to analyze why exactly they failed. Did they fail for a tactical reason or maybe a strategic one? And it can be very difficult to figure it out but just turning on the engine for a second and seeing what the best move was, you know, at the position when you went wrong, this is really, really not a lot. And, and this is why coaches often criticize the use of engines, because what most players do is they just turn the engine on in a position. They see the top move. They just assume, well, I guess that's the best move. Bishop takes b5. And they think that's the end of the story. Um, but often it's not. And this is why I wanted to start with uh, this position. Because the best move in this position is actually the sacrifice bishop takes h7 check. Uh, this one is actually completely winning for white. But as you can see, the engine, at least the one built in on chess.com and I'm sure in other places as well, is not going to consider this move for quite some time. Uh, we see it's given as the third option here and evaluated as equal. Um, but as it starts to think for longer and longer, we can see the depth here is now past 30. Uh, Stockfish is actually going to realize the power of this sacrifice. But it's been a couple minutes. It took a couple minutes to get here. And most players, when they're analyzing their games, they just turn the engine on for a couple of seconds. They see the evaluation and they think they're done. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, the way to actually apply this during your analysis is to use uh, the first of two techniques I want to share with you guys uh, that I'm going to refer to as feeding. You want to feed your ideas into the engine and force it to calculate your moves, especially if you want an answer. For instance, let's say this was your game and during the game you were thinking about sacrificing on h7, but you ultimately couldn't make it work and decided to play something else. Well, then after the game, it will be really, really valuable for you to actually analyze a sacrifice and see whether it works or whether it doesn't work and why or why not. And that's going to be very, very instructive. It's not enough for the engine to just tell you, oh, it doesn't work or oh, it just leads to a draw. You want to kind of dig in and investigate why. Because number one, you might be right. Your sacrifice might actually be working and it's only when you actually feed the move into the engine that it starts to take it seriously and actually evaluates its full strength. And the reason that it does that is because in the given position, White has something like 20 legal moves here. Well, the engine is analyzing all of them. It's analyzing every single move that White has in the position and every single response that Black has. And those millions and millions of moves really take a lot of time to go through. So if you want to be expedient with the engine, you got to play the move on the board. And now Stockfish is forced to analyze this position from Black's point of view. Now that Bishop takes h7 has been played. And if it finds a defense, it finds a defense. But if not, then it'll realize, well, the sacrifice is actually winning and we'll see the evaluation uh, go up. Now on chess.com, the engine kind of resets every move. So <laughs> once it sees this position again for the first time, it still doesn't think uh, that the sacrifice is working. But let's take a look and, and see why it is. So after king takes h7, uh, white plays the move rook to d7. Uh, Stockfish sees this one. This is a strong move uh, because it activates the rook with a tempo. Uh, and as we'll see, it sets up white's next move as well. Uh, black played queen c8, which is also the engine's choice. And in this position, as we can see, uh, Stockfish doesn't immediately see a win for white. And when it's calculating from afar, it's already calculating these lines. And as you can see, even here, it doesn't find the win immediately. So from afar, it's going to take quite some time. And now once we give it a little bit of time, as we can see, it only needed depth 26 here to realize that the move rook hd1 is completely winning. Uh, kudos to Christopher, by the way, for finding this combination. Very, very nice uh, find. So this is quite a quiet move, and that's why the engine doesn't really appreciate it at first. 
if it was something like a forced checkmate, you know, bishop takes h7 check, knight g5 check, queen h5, the engine can calculate those things very, very quickly. But when it comes to slow moving sacrifices, where you're going to be down a piece uh, for several moves at a time, well, then sometimes the engine needs quite a bit more guidance in order to fully figure out all of the complications. So what is happening here? Why is white winning? Well, the point is that white is ready now to lift this rook over to d3 and eventually play queen h5 check, forcing the king back to g8, play the move rook h3, and white will just have an overwhelming mating attack. So let's see how this played out. Black played the move king to g8. White lifted the rook with rook 1 d3. Bishop c6, and now white follows the plan with rook h3. Really, really strong move with the idea that if black captures the rook on d7, then white goes queen to h5. And because this knight on e5 is covering the f7 square, well, black simply has no way to get out of checkmate. And we can see the evaluation here is plus m5, which on chess.com means uh, main in five and white is winning uh, due to the plus sign. If it was black to mate, we would see uh, a minus sign here. Instead, in the game, black played queen takes d7, hoping to uh, give the queen up and try to stave off the attack, but white didn't uh, blink here, goes queen to h5, and black had to uh, give this check. White steps aside, queen d1, only way not to get mated is to just uh, sacrifice the queen for at least one move. But after queen takes d1, rook f d8, and queen h5, black was anyway getting mated and decided to resign. With our next example, I want to share with you guys another technique that I think can be really useful to aid your analysis. Uh, and that's something that I'm going to refer to as comparison. Uh, this is a game between Fabiano Caruana and Magnus Carlsen from 2014. Uh, in fact, this was one of the games in uh, the historic Sinkfield Cup tournament where Caruana started uh, 7 out of 7 uh, before facing Magnus in round 8, where Magnus was finally able to uh, make a draw. And this was a really critical moment um, at this point. As you can see, White had a big advantage uh, in this game. Uh, and what happened was Fabiano played the move rook c to d1, hitting the d6 pawn with a tactical idea that if knight takes c4, he has queen d5 check, picking up the knight. Uh, Magnus found the best move here, king to h8, getting the king off of the g file and away from any checks. And then after queen takes d6, queen takes d6, rook takes d6, uh, black played knight takes c4. And although white was still better, Magnus was eventually able to hold this one. Uh, and if we go back to the critical position, it's easy to see what the engine suggests uh, instead for white if we let it run for uh, a little while here. Uh, the engine is going to suggest a couple of moves, rook g1 check, uh, as well as rook f d1. And in particular, this move rook f d1, as we'll see, is rated very highly by Stockfish. And this is a classic moment where you don't want to just, again, take the engine at its word. You want to at least understand why is rook fd1 better than rook cd1. Uh, now, what I would recommend is first just trying to figure this out on your own. And if you want a little bit of time, just pause the video and think about it. Why would rook fd1 be so much more accurate than rook cd1? And if you haven't figured it out, well, play the move on the board and force the engine to show you. And this is where comparison is really useful. So let's take a look again at rook c to d1. If we see the engine's evaluations here, uh, it basically says that king h8 is kind of a strict only move. Everything else just leads to white taking on d6 uh, and having a big advantage. So then let's go back, let's play rook fd1 on the board and now take let's take a look at what it's suggesting for black. King h8 doesn't really show up, which is really odd. But let's play king h8 on the board. This was the defense for the other move. Why doesn't it work here? Well, let's take a look. Okay, queen takes d6 plus 3. That's very promising. And we now remember, well, in the other line, after queen takes d6 and rook takes d6, black had this move, knight takes c4. And now, of course, it's very clear. Well, the rook was defending the pawn. Black can't uh, win this pawn, instead has to move the knight. We also see that the bishop is hitting c5. And given that the engine has a huge evaluation here, we can conclude that white is uh, likely winning this one due to the extra material. Now, that's kind of an obvious point. Once you simply ask the question, well, which one is better? What's the difference between rook fd1 or rook cd1? 
But a quick glance at this game or, you know, just playing through it and, and checking the evaluation, uh, you might easily, easily miss this point. And of course, it's it's only when you ask questions and really challenge the engine that you'll be able to actually learn something. And that's what this is all about. It's all about checking your ideas against the engine, challenging the engine, and trying to uncover some details about the position that were obviously not visible at a superficial glance. This is really where you can just get the most value out of working with the engine by forcing it to find ideas that were not obvious to you before. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. Uh, if you found it useful, please do leave a thumbs up on it. It really does help the channel out uh, quite a bit. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, well, make sure to do so for future videos on chess improvement. Uh, with that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.